Welcome back to another video. Today I'm in a completely different setup and it will stay that way for the next five weeks or so because I moved to the Canary Islands on Monday and will stay here for at least five weeks, maybe a bit longer, we'll see. Or maybe I will move somewhere else, digital nomad style. And today I'm gonna talk about mining, which is something I never really covered before, besides the video that I did on the energy efficiency of Bitcoin. I'll explain the what, why and how of mining in three different expertise levels, from beginner to advanced to Bitcoin veteran, adding new concepts in each step and also getting more and more technical. My goal is that everyone can learn something new from this video. Let's start with the very basics, level 1, beginner. If you ever heard anything about Bitcoin mining, it's probably that it describes the process of creating new Bitcoin. The term mining comes from real world resources like gold. Just like gold mining introduces new gold that comes from the ground into the economy, Bitcoin mining introduces new Bitcoin into the economy. They just don't come from a mine, as Bitcoin are created digitally. But this new coin creation is actually not the interesting part about the mining process. It's the what, but not the why. It's simply a means to an end. New coins as a reward to mining are simply the incentive. The why is what matters. Mining secures the Bitcoin system and enables the emergence of network-wide consensus without a central authority. The reward of newly minted coins and transaction fees is an incentive scheme that aligns the actions of miners with the security of the network while simultaneously implementing the monetary supply. So the main goal of Bitcoin mining is the following, keeping the ledger decentralized, which is one of the key value propositions of Bitcoin. You hear people pitching it as digital gold or digital cash, but more important is that it's decentralized gold and decentralized cash. No one is in control of the network. This is ensured by having a lottery of who becomes the next bank clerk. There is not one central authority. Everyone can become a miner and apply for the lottery of who's next to decide which pending transactions to add to the blockchain. If there would be just one miner, the system would be centralized and censoring transactions would be easy to do. And how does it work? Well, for a level 1 beginner understanding, I can only be quite superficial here. What miners do is guess a random number. It's a challenge. Whoever is first to guess a fitting number becomes the bank clerk for the next block. More computing power means you have more guesses and therefore a higher chance to win. This guessing process happens on average every 10 minutes, because it takes 10 minutes on average for all the miners combined to guess a correct number. Afterwards, the lottery begins anew. And as I said, everyone can participate. The winner of the lottery becomes the bank clerk for that specific block and gets rewarded with new Bitcoin. This whole process is also known as proof of work. The beauty of it is that it takes a lot of work in terms of many guesses to guess correctly, but it is very easy for others to verify that the solution is indeed correct once it was found. Famous Bitcoin evangelist Andreas Antonopoulos gave an analogy with Sudoku riddles. Solving the Sudoku takes work, but once you are done, it's very easy for others to check if your solution is correct. Once someone solves it, he gets rewarded with new Bitcoin and the next Sudoku begins. Now if you think about this initial explanation for a bit, you will probably be able to come up with at least a handful of questions. How is it possible that the average of new blocks remains 10 minutes? I mean, computers get better and better and the more people start mining, the faster mining should become, right? And why does this 10 minute rule even matter in the first place? Why would anyone want a system that takes a lot of computing power devoted to guessing random numbers? What's the point? Where do the new Bitcoin actually come from? And how does it actually work? Can you please stop talking about Sudokus? And to really answer these questions, we need to move to the next level. Level 2. Advanced. The guesser of the correct number gets to decide which transactions he wants to include in the new block. They would usually take the transactions that have the highest fees in them, because next to the block reward, the miner collects the fee as well. But they could also deliberately not include a transaction to censor it. This left out transaction remains in the memory pool until another miner includes it after winning the lottery. What makes this somewhat constant 10 minute rule possible is the dynamic difficulty adjustment of the algorithm. This is the most underappreciated aspect of Bitcoin. No matter how much computing power the entire network has, the block confirmation time stays at around 10 minutes. To ensure this, every 2016 blocks there is a check if the average clearance has been higher or lower than 10 minutes during this time period. The difficulty of the guessing problem is depending on the target set by the protocol. This formula shows how the new target is calculated. So if the network finds blocks faster than every 10 minutes, the difficulty increases or the target decreases. If it finds blocks slower than every 10 minutes, the difficulty decreases or the target increases. The 10 minute rule is implemented for two primary reasons. One, to circumvent chain splittings. With super fast block clearances, the blockchain could fork all over the place and it becomes harder to follow the right chain. Nodes always follow the longest chain by the way. And second, more importantly, it keeps the supply predictable. You can calculate how many Bitcoin will exist 30 years from now because of the supply schedule that is independent from how much computing power the network has. Adding a new block to the blockchain every 10 minutes is Bitcoin's sense of time. 
It's like Bitcoin's heartbeat, a definite order of events. Bitcoin solves the double spending problem by reinventing time itself. It says no to seconds and yes to blocks. You always need to know who gave how much to whom and most importantly, when. By utilizing the causality of hash chains and the unpredictability of proof of work, the Bitcoin network provides a mechanism for establishing an indisputable history of events witnessed. Proof of work is necessary to have a clear order of events that is causal, unpredictable and coordinated. This concept of time is so important that the initial blockchain was called time chain. Coordination is made possible by the difficulty adjustment, the magic source that links Bitcoin's time to ours. Without this bridge between the physical and the informational realm, it would be impossible to agree on a time by relying on nothing but data. The issuance of new coins when mining is also geometrically decreasing every 210,000 blocks, so roughly every 4 years, which leads to a supply cap of just under 21 million Bitcoin. The scarcity is one of Bitcoin's key value propositions. When the block reward becomes lower and lower every 4 years, it becomes necessary to finance the miners with fees. Once a predetermined number of coins have entered circulation, the incentive can transition entirely to transaction fees and be completely inflation free. Now let's have a short digression into mining hardware and different mining options. New technologies to mine more efficiently have been found a few times already. From CPU to GPU to FPGA to ASICs, which is what is still used today. But again, no matter how powerful the mining machines become, the next difficulty adjustment will ensure that new blocks get created every 10 minutes. You can theoretically still mine with the CPU, but you just won't make any money. The electricity costs will be higher than your returns. You can also join mining pools to compete against huge mining farms. Joining a pool is great to get some rewards with just a bit of mining power. You get a reward proportional to how much mining power you add to the pool. Bitcoin mining in general is only profitable if you have access to cheap energy. Otherwise, you just get driven out by other miners that have cheaper energy. The hash rate, which is a measure of the computing power of the network, always follows the price. If Bitcoin's price rises, so does the profitability of mining. The result is that more miners enter the network, increasing the hash rate, which ultimately reduces the margin for everyone. Another option would be cloud mining, which means others mine Bitcoin for you, so that you don't need to invest in the necessary equipment. I would advise caution here, as most cloud miners are either simply not profitable or are Ponzi schemes that promise returns but are actually not mining anything. Now it's time to get into the more intricate details of Bitcoin mining. It's time for level 3, the Bitcoin veteran. The first thing we need to talk about are cryptographic hash functions or more specifically the 256-bit secure hash algorithm also known as SHA-256, developed by the NSA. SHA-256 is used in security applications and protocols like TLS, SSL, PGP, SSH and Bitcoin. What SHA-256 does is encrypt any message, file or piece of information into a unique combination of ones and zeros. The important part is that the result looks completely random. If you change just one bit of information, you end up with a completely different hash. The hash you get is also completely unpredictable. Let's say I want to hash my name. This is what I would get every single time. If I change it to another name, there's no way for me to know what the result will be. And this plays an important role in more than one aspect for Bitcoin, but we are focusing on mining today. Miners need to create a block header before starting the guessing game. Let's go through some of the necessary fields. The number used once is the number that needs to be guessed by the miner. We will see how in a minute. The resulting hash of the block needs to be lower than the target. The target is calculated by the network. The current target for block 694288 is this. So it starts with 18 zeros followed by a 1. The number is in hexadecimal format. Again, the hash of the block needs to be lower than this number. And that gives you the difficulty of the guessing problem. What the miners do is adding the number used once to the block and changing it so often until the hash for the whole block has more zeros than the target. For this specific block, this was the hash that the miner found. It starts with 19 zeros. You can try finding a working number yourself to get a feeling of how many tries are necessary with some online tools. Here I put my name as an example and I'm looking for a hash that starts with two zeros. I got one zero after only two tries and got two zeros after 42 tries. You could also do this randomly and not in an incremental way. The probability to get a hash that starts with three zeros is already 1 in 4096. So I didn't bother to look for a third zero. The exponential growth picks up fast. You can calculate the probability of finding a number that when added to a message generates a hash with 19 starting zeros when using hexadecimal format. It's 1 divided by 16 to the power of 19, which is a pretty large number. 
What proof of work does is that it's very hard to find a correct number in terms of the guesses that you need. You just need to guess many many times and that is the work that you put in. But once you've found the number, it's very easy to verify that it is the correct number. Everyone can easily verify that it's the correct number. They just need it to the message, run SHA-256 once and see that the resulting hash starts with a given amount of zeros. The unpredictability of incoming transactions and proof of work also makes sure that the order of blocks stays the same over time. Because every new block includes the hash of the previous block. By adding the hash of the previous block, you cannot easily reorganize blocks. The older the block is, the more certain it becomes that it stands exactly like that for eternity. Because changing one single element, like one transaction, would mean all the proof of work of all the following blocks would need to be redone. The majority decision is represented by the longest chain, which has the greatest proof of work effort invested in it. If a majority of CPU power is controlled by honest nodes, the honest chain will grow the fastest and outpace any competing chains. To modify a past block, an attacker would have to redo the proof of work of the block and all blocks after it and then catch up with and surpass the work of the honest nodes. The probability of a slower attacker catching up diminishes exponentially as subsequent blocks are added. The probability of this attack is also formally described in the white paper and can be characterized as a binomial random walk. Let P be the probability an honest node finds the next block, and Q be the probability the attacker finds the next block. Then QZ is the probability the attacker will ever catch up from Z blocks behind. If the attacker has less than 50% of the whole computing power, the fraction is smaller than 1 and therefore trends towards 0 with a rising amount of blocks Z. Let's have one example. Let's say the honest chain has 55% of the computing power and the attacker chain has 45%. The probability that the attacker catches up from 10 blocks behind is 45 divided by 55 to the power of 10, which equals 13%. And the probability that the attacker catches up from 100 blocks behind is 45 divided by 55 to the power of 100. And as you can see, it's extremely low. A threat to the network is a 51% attack, in which case the attacker has more computing power than the rest of the network combined. But the higher the growing hash rate goes, the less likely this case becomes, as it's simply insanely expensive to attack the network in such a way. The consequences are also often misunderstood. But what happens when the hash rate is no longer distributed well enough? What happens if one single entity is able to obtain more than 50% of the hashing power? One possible consequence of that is what we call a 51% attack, also known as a majority attack. A 51% attack is a potential attack on a blockchain network where a single entity or organization is able to control the majority of the hash rate, potentially causing a network disruption. In such a scenario, the attacker would have enough mining power to intentionally exclude or modify the ordering of transactions. They could also reverse transactions they made while being in control, leading to a double spending problem. A successful majority attack could also allow the attacker to prevent some or all transactions from being confirmed or to prevent miners from mining, resulting in what is known as mining monopoly. On the other hand, a majority attack would not allow the attacker to reverse transactions from other users, nor to prevent transactions from being created and broadcasted to the network. Changing the block's reward, creating coins out of thin air, or stealing coins that never belong to the attacker are also not possible. Another fraudulent attempt could be a miner trying to add a block with a higher target, thereby a lower difficulty, or starting the hash with less zeros. In this case, other network participants will easily reject the block. Everyone is incentivized to play by the rules, which is beautiful. We also haven't clarified yet where the new Bitcoin come from and how they get added to the miners' addresses. The so-called block reward is added as the first transaction in a block. It has no sender or signature and is also known as the Coinbase transaction. There is another interesting security feature in the Coinbase transaction that not many people know about. The Bitcoin involved in this transaction can only be sent again or spent for the first time after the respective block has received 100 confirmations, meaning 100 blocks added to the chain or about 17 hours. This Coinbase transaction is also set by each miner individually. The current maximal block reward are 6.25 Bitcoin. But you could potentially say you only want one Bitcoin. In that case, the other 5.25 Bitcoin will never enter the supply. In some blocks, some miners have actually done that. It makes absolutely no sense from an economic perspective though. It's just more of a fun fact. And here's another mining fun fact. Because Bitcoin mining is solving an algorithmic math problem, you could theoretically do it by hand by calculating the SHA-256 values. But as you can guess, computers are so much faster that humans mining Bitcoin with pen and paper looks hilarious when you break down the numbers. 
If you'd started mining manually at the start of the universe 13.8 billion years ago, you would have $0.000887 worth of bitcoins right now. Now that sounds profitable. One last addition before I close this video, you can get a ton of mining numbers through insights.brains.com where you can also calculate what it costs to mine a bitcoin depending on your electricity cost, block subsidy, pool fee, hash rate and more. That's it, I hope you enjoyed it and gained some new insights from it. If you did, I would appreciate it if you leave a like and subscribe to the channel for further content. And then I see you next time.